Welcome, everyone. My name is Adam Savitt. I'm Director of Communications at the Center for Security Policy. I'm pleased to welcome you back to our Voter Education Project series. We're holding webinar events meant to educate the American voter on crucial national security issues every week, right up through Election Day. Believe it or not, uh, of course, we're three weeks out. So after today, we only have two additional programs. Um, for more info and to register for those, please check out our schedule at securefreedom.org. Uh, but as far as today, our program is entitled Much More Than a Trade War, Understanding National Security, the Economy, and Trade Policy, featuring our guest, Kevin Freeman, and moderated by my center colleague, Christopher Holton. Please note that you are in listen-only mode, but you can submit your text questions in the Q&A box on your GoToWebinar panel. We'll get to as many questions as possible at the end of the program. This event is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash securefreedom, and on our website at securefreedom.org. And with that, I'll hand it over to the Center Senior Analyst, Christopher Holton. Thank you very much, Adam. Welcome, everyone. I'm Christopher Holton, Senior Analyst at the Center for Security Policy. It is my great privilege and honor to have as a guest on this webinar, Kevin Freeman. Uh, he really needs no introduction for, no doubt, for many members of our audience, but for those of you who are not familiar with Kevin, Kevin Freeman is considered one of the world's leading experts on the issues of economic warfare and financial terrorism. He has consulted for and briefed members of both the U.S. House and Senate, present and past CIA, DIA, FBI, SEC, Homeland Security, and Justice Department officials, as well as local and state law enforcement across America. His research has been presented in the Department of Defense Studies on Economic Warfare, Iran, and Weapons of Mass Destruction, presented to the Secretary of Defense and the Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence. He has traveled extensively with research trips to Russia and China and throughout Europe and the Americas. He is also a senior fellow, we're happy to say, at the Center for Security Policy and is a contributing editor to Counterterrorist Magazine. Kevin also is the operator, host, publisher, and editor of The Economic War Room. Uh, the Economic War Room is a digital media and weekly broadcast financial news show that provides new market insights to the challenges America and Wall Street face today as the investment community recognizes new forces of geopolitical and economic change. Its mission is to provide insights and updates allowing investment professionals, financial advisors, and their clients to develop personalized financial solutions. Welcome, Kevin Freeman. Thank you very much for joining us, sir. Thank you, Chris. I'm a big fan of the Center for Security Policy and the great work that you're doing there. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk on this topic. Um, if you watched the uh, debates last week, uh, the vice presidential debates, they referenced a trade war with China and uh, the Senator Harris uh, said, you know, you've lost the trade war and and uh, Vice President uh, Pence came back and said, you didn't even fight the trade war, referencing uh, Biden and so forth. But it's so much more than a trade war. And, and I think we tend to characterize any type of economic conflict as trade related, but it goes much beyond that. Uh, and so we're going to talk about that. We're going to discuss in much broader context uh, what economic warfare is, and we're going to talk about what, what it historically has been, uh, talk about what it is um, currently taking place and what it, where it's likely to head in the future. And I know everyone's heard it said, it's all about the money. Guess what? There's a lot of truth in that. It generally is all about the money. And when we have conflict between nations, even when it's kinetic conflict, it is often about economics, whether they're, you're fighting for oil in the Middle East or whether you're fighting for trade abilities or whatever it is, it very often is about the money and therefore it fits in the context of economic warfare. A friend of the center, a good friend of mine, a Lieutenant General Stephen Quass, and he was the retired Air Force uh, Lieutenant General who headed all of the uh, Air Education and Training Command, meaning if you were in the Air Force, you were under him in terms of training, whether you were a new recruit or, or all the way up. And he, he's an amazing guy. He was a fighter pilot with the call sign Killer Quast. Um, 
and he worked on grid resiliency, something else the center has done. And he, you know, held some summits uh, at the Air Force Base in San Antonio. Just a brilliant guy. Well, he confirmed, I was talking to him in the economic war room on one of our shows, and he said, yeah, it, it really is generally all about the money. And he has studied military conflict throughout history, and he educates people and says, that in the bottom line, there's an economic component to almost every conflict. Um, bottom line, he said, we're trying to decide which economy will dominate this century, and that will determine whose culture dominates the century. Now, in 2013, let me see if I can find the flyer, I was invited to uh, speak uh, to the Defense Intelligence Agency because what had happened is I read uh, a research report put out by the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and it was written by a man named Michael Swain. And, and Michael made the point that uh, whichever economy dominates in 2050, 2050, that economy or that nation will dominate the Pacific Rim, the Asian uh, Asian part of our world. And I took that to heart. I believed what he said. And so I wrote a blog about that. And I said, well, if the Chinese are aware of this and they realize that the, that the uh, competition between China and the United States is that severe and they realize that the economic, the stronger economy is going to dominate the region, then we can assume that they will do whatever they can possibly to emerge as the stronger economy, including using unrestricted warfare techniques against our economy. And um, I, I, I wrote that and, you know, I got an email very shortly after from one of our blog subscribers who was Lieutenant General Mike Flynn, the head of the Defense Intelligence Agency. And so he invited me to come in 2013. 13, I think it was, maybe 2012, and I attended and had actually a debate because despite uh, Dr. Swain saying uh, that he was certain that the dominant economy would be the one that, that uh, controlled the region, he completely disagreed with my conclusion that the Chinese might possibly do something to become the dominant economy, including acts of unrestricted warfare. And he brought with him a senior official at the World Bank who also happened to be a Chinese national, and we had a debate. And, and I thought, you know, this is kind of an unfair fight. Here's a, a guy that heads the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and, and a senior World Bank official coming up against a Texas money manager. Uh, but okay, let's bring it on. And uh, I had reports afterwards from those who were present in the DIA, you know, the my argument won. It didn't win necessarily because I was the better person make the, making the argument. They're clearly brighter and, and better positioned than I am. It won because it's right. If you realize the nature of warfare and the purpose of warfare and the large economic components associated with that, then you understand that nations will do whatever necessary to make certain their economy comes out on top. If it was well, true, then it's even truer today. At its most basic level, it's that simple. It can get really complex. You can go really deep into how difficult economic warfare, but let's keep it at that very simple terms. Dominant economies dominate uh, geopolitics. That's the way it works. So the three parts we're gonna cover, each, each about 10 minutes or so, history of economic warfare, the modern era of economic warfare, and the future of economic warfare. And then uh, Chris, I'd be thrilled to take questions from you and and from the audience. So what I wanna do first is I wanna take uh, from a chapter of a book, oh, by the way, here, here here's the flyer when I was at the Defense Intelligence Agency, and I guess it was June, 2013. Uh, but around that time, I think this was September, 2012, I was asked to write uh, for the Pentagon, Weapons of Mass Destruction and Evolving Threat. And this went to the Secretary of Defense. I think it was Leon Panetta at the time. And it covered all the different types of weapons of mass destruction. And I'll just read from it. Uh, uh, understanding WMD, uh, history and evolution of WMD, capabilities, uh, the inventory of the United States, the inventory of the UK and France and others. Uh, it walked through, uh, you know, chemical weapons, biological weapons, uh, nuclear weapons, uh, military capabilities, you walk through. 
cyber warfare, which is a type of economic warfare. Uh, and then it wrapped up chapter 23 was economic warfare. And that's the chapter that I was asked to write. And, and so I'm going to take from this, and I'm just going to read just, just a tiny bit from page 282 of this report. Um, because it really sums up the history. Economic warfare is not a new concept. In fact, it is long and storied history and has played a significant role in the outcome of major conflicts. Uh, for the purpose of this study, economic warfare is defined as state-sponsored act against another state's economy to coerce that government into taking a certain action with financial terrorism defined as a secret behind the scenes manipulation of a nation's economy by state or non-state actors. Well, it, this recounts blockades, tariffs, embargoes that go all the way back to the Peloponnesian Wars. Now we're talking Athens versus Sparta. And Athens used economic warfare by blockades against the Spartan economy. But the Spartans responded by raiding Athenian land to burn their crops and hurt their economy. It goes on throughout history and in moder more modern times, World War II, for example, we actually developed a Bureau of Economic Warfare under President Franklin Roosevelt. And it was, it was really phenomenal because we knew largely that we were fighting an economic conflict. If the Germans had access to sufficient fuel and energy uh, resources, which was an economic problem for them, uh, they might have won. So we used energy as a weapon. And the energy weapon actually began before that when President Roosevelt cut off the Japanese from oil imports. And the Japanese economy could not survive without oil imports. And Pearl Harbor was one of the results of that. They had to lash out and fight back. But there was a lot of economic warfare during World War II. Uh, there was something known as Operation Bernard. The Germans had a very sophisticated counterfeiting unit uh, that was named after the man who came up with the idea. And, and they literally were flooding the British uh, economy with fake pounds. They were producing fake British pounds, counterfeiting them, and pu pushing them out in the British economy with the hope that they could crack the economy. Um, in World War II, we used economic weapons as well including what I talked about, uh, energy imports and so forth. We, we purposed to bomb uh, not just military installations, but those that were doing war production that were a part of the wartime economy. The Cold War following World War II took us to a whole new level. And I'm not saying the United States has been exempt from this. In fact, not many people realize that in 1956, uh, the Egyptians decided they would take the Suez Canal. The British and the French who had financed and built it said, wait a minute, you can't take that. That's our property. And uh, we were concerned about uh, Egypt falling into the Soviet orbit, the communist orbit. And so President Eisenhower uh, found out that they were planning to invade in a military response, take back the Suez Canal. And he basically said to the British and French, if you do this, uh, we will stop buying your debt. And this was a big threat to the British. The British were, had massive debt. Uh, they still had World War II debt and they had lost their reserve currency status. It was eroded and, and, and transferred to the United States. So they threatened to sell our debt and not buy any or sell the British debt, and not buy any additional British debt, which would have crushed the British economy. And so they backed off as a result. That's a type of economic warfare, something we did to one of our allies at the time. So we, we, we participated in this as well. Uh, with the Soviets, we used economic warfare as well. Our main goal was initially to contain the Soviets and prevent them from being able to develop weapons. Uh, so that's part of the history. The uh, Arab oil embargo is also part of the history. In 1973, they thought they would crush our economy by stopping the export of oil to the United States. Uh, so there was a lot of economic warfare taking place during the Cold War, but really President Ronald Reagan took economic warfare to a whole new level. And, and the result of that was we broke the Soviet Union, we won the Cold War, the wall in Berlin came down uh, and we declared victory. It was one of the most significant uh, events of the last hundred years. 
and President Reagan accomplished that largely using uh, economic warfare techniques. Uh, one of the things we did is we embargoed technology from the Russians. I mean, unbelievable, but we were allowing, uh, up until President Reagan, allowing the Russians to buy a lot of American technology and advance, this is the beginning of the computer age, advance their uh, ability to modernize with computer systems. Uh, so President Reagan put an embargo on that, but he was very, very smart. We not only embargoed them, but we gave them the ability to steal uh, some computer chips that we developed that were very special that uh, that the KGB came into a trade show, walked out with, they put them into their trans-Siberian uh, pipeline control system, and the net result of it was there was an explosion in the trans-Siberian pipeline that could be seen from outer space. It, it was very crafty. Uh, we did a lot of other things. We cut off uh, funding of Russian companies, something that had happened. And Roger Robinson helped, uh, who's a friend of the center, helped cut off uh, access to Western capital. Now, they responded, and I think this is something that's important to understand. We hear a lot about Russian collusion in the election. You know, that's the meme that's been put out quite frequently. I wanna tell you a true story. In the year 1984, when Ted Kennedy was in contact with the Politburo and the KGB, and I literally said to them, if you will help me get elected and beat this evil Ronald Reagan, I will have a very pro-Soviet, pro-detente policy uh, following the election. And he reached out and there was dialogue. Now, this is, <laughs> this is absolute fact. This is not conjecture. This is not conspiracy theory. This documentation came straight from KGB archives after the wall fell in Berlin. We have it, it's well documented. Now, the media doesn't apparently want to talk about that, but that was absolute true Russian collusion with, uh, with icon Ted Kennedy that took place in 1984. I mean, so, so this is a back and forth that, that we have going on here. Um, we also had President Reagan to help break the Soviet Union. He worked with uh, Maggie Thatcher, uh, the prime minister. He worked with the Pope. And we orchestrated with the Saudis an oil price plunge. And I've, I've got a book here somewhere uh, that, that uh, here it is, Paul Kingor wrote The Divine Plan that, that kind of details some of the efforts to break the Soviet Union. And a large part of that was economic warfare. But after the wall fell, uh, we kind of abandoned economic warfare as an offensive tactic. In fact, under uh, President Clinton, uh, there wasn't seen to be the need to have this economic aggressiveness. And so they literally separated the National Security Council and the National Economic Groups, separated. And the discussion for the National Security Council became military and pro-defense. And the discussions at um, uh, separating out Wall Street, hey, we won the Cold War, the idea was. Uh, therefore, let's go dominate the planet economically. And the job of, of the security people is just to make sure that everything stays safe and secure. We don't have a viable competitor on the world scene. And so the thinking of integration of the disciplines of economics and national security re really was kind of broken during that period. At the same time, our adversaries who witnessed our incredible military capabilities and that we were the dominant player on the planet, uh, decided they would ramp up their economic warfare capabilities. And also private actors such as George Soros realized that not only could you achieve geopolitical aims, but you could also make money doing it. And so Soros is known as the guy who broke the Bank of England in 1992 because he shorted the British pound and, and literally caused it to crack. And as a result, uh, Britain wasn't, uh, the British pound wasn't really all that interesting to the Euro and the Euro interested in, and it kept the British out of the Euro, which they, they might actually wanna thank George Soros for now. But uh, also during that period, North Korea began production of super dollars. They picked up from Operation Bernard that the Germans had and they started counterfeiting like crazy and these super dollars are really well done, and there are a lot of them still in circulation today. It's really hard to separate them. In 1998, 
and I want I want to make a strong point of this. A Russian professor named Igor Panarin came out and gave a presentation to 400 delegates in Linz, Austria. And I want to set the stage for this because in Linz, Austria, this delegation pulled together and a Russian professor speaking and this Russian professor is talking about, and I put in the context, that's when the Russian currency crisis and the Asian currency crisis was underway. The United States had actually reduced our debt. We actually ran a balanced budget, at least according to the official figures. Our economy was booming. And yet this Russian history professor came out and said the United States was going to collapse maybe in about 10 years, as soon as 10 years, and divide into five different nations. And they would be under different influences. The West Coast would be under Chinese influence. Uh, the upper Midwest would be Canada, the East Coast under European, uh, uh, Russia would take Alaska, and uh, the Southwest would be uh, kind of on their own, but under Mexican, in a, in a you know, Southwest in Mexico and Latin America influence. And he said it with a straight face. When Russia was in the worst economic position it had been, this was before Putin had taken power, and he was a KGB buddy of Putin's. Now, why did he say that? Well, this is based on an old KGB doctrine. I've got some books here uh, that uh, We Will Bury You by Jan Shana and New Lies for Old by uh, Golitsyn. They were talking about how the KGB had long decided economic warfare was the way to take down America. And some of this is echoed in the book uh, Disinformation that, that's been out more recently. But if we're going to take down America, we're going to have to take down the culture, the economy, and so forth. And so he said, if we do it right, we can cause America to overspend. And we had we were working on a balanced budget at the time. Overspend. The U.S. dollar would collapse from excessive American debt. Ten years after that was written, Vladimir Putin called up um, the Chinese and said, Hey, America is in a financial crisis in 2008. This is our opportunity. Maybe we ought to collapse the U.S. dollar, and we could do that uh, by dumping our Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac holdings. Fortunately, the Chinese did not join them, uh, but that was a direct economic attack. You saw Fannie and Freddie fail in the summer of 2008. It hurt us right in the midst of a housing bubble bursting, it was directly targeted and it was a Russian economic warfare attack. And I'm not just making this up. Hank Paulson, former Treasury Secretary, wrote about that in his memoirs, admitting that that had happened. Economic warfare in the modern era from Russia. Uh, in 2014, the Russians also did an oil war against us. The intention was to drive out fracking. They funded environmental groups to try and get fracking banned which has popped up in the presidential debates again, uh, the, the Russians have been funding this. And this again, uh, and the head of NATO, Anders Fogg Rasmussen at the time, acknowledged that the Russians were funding environmental groups to ban fracking. This is all economic warfare. And then they even tried this year, uh, what I call oil war too. The Saudis also, uh, they, they worked against the fracking industry both in 2014 and earlier this year. And then they floated Saudi Aramco, the largest initial public offering in history, displacing Alibaba uh, so that we could own a piece of Saudi Aramco. All of this connected to economic warfare. And of course, in the modern era, uh, we also have um, Osama bin Laden and the attacks on the World Trade Center. We have the death of a thousand cuts. That was the intention. He said it publicly. They hit the World Trade Center not to cause the mass casualties. On any Saturday afternoon in, in the year 2001, you, you could have uh, hit a uh, football stadium with an airliner and killed uh, 75, 100,000 people. You could have killed many more people. The goal of hitting the World Trade Center was to hit our economy. It was economic warfare. It cost them, you know, some estimate the budget was around $100,000. And the goal was to crater our economy. It costs us trillions of dollars in response. The Atlantic wrote up a great piece on explaining what, how brilliant that was. 
So these are all in the modern era with uh, jihadists, for example. The Iranians, I did some work with the district attorney of New York. Uh, uh, they were catching the Iranians using our banking system to fund uh, operations around the world. It's a type of economic warfare. We caught a bunch of banks and they had to pay enormous billions of dollars in fines because they were going along with this, uh, but they were infiltrating our banking system. In the end, it really is all about the money. The Iran deal was about the money, the sanctions are about the money, and so forth. All of this is a part of modern era economic warfare. And I wrote a book. In 2008, we had a stock market crash, and I wrote a book, Secret Weapon. This is based on the report I did for the Pentagon, uh, which was Economic Warfare Risks and Responses, which I think is still available on the internet. You can read it. This is my true story of uh, fighting inside the Pentagon to get them to recognize the need for addressing economic warfare and then exactly what happened. And I'll tell you what happened. Two sovereign wealth funds in the Middle East in 2008 began what are known as bear raids against our stock market, Lehman Brothers, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan and, and uh, Bear Stearns, other major firms. They found their weakness that they had, and they went and attacked them using financial weapons of mass destruction, defined by Warren Buffett, no less, who said uh, credit default swaps and naked short selling are types of financial weapons of mass destruction. And naked short selling, which was the big one that, that literally took down uh lehman brothers in 2008 and when lehman failed the entire economy failed and when the economy failed that's when uh the poll shifted in 2008 john mccain and, and sarah palin were leading on september 11th 2008 in the gallup polls by a measurable amount and once lehman brothers failed which happened that week uh, they were never again seen in the lead, let alone even close to Barack Obama and Joe Biden. And it is my belief that this was known and understood as a trigger mechanism to change who was going to be in the White House. And I believe that, uh, again, it was uh, foreign interference in our elections. Interestingly, I was told by the Obama Defense Department, you should never bring that up. In fact, at one point they told me, that they would classify my research on this topic and put me in jail if I ever discussed it. And if it weren't for a friend of the center, Jim Woolsey and Frank Gaffney and a few others, uh, they might have gotten away with that. But fortunately, there was an outreach to John McCain, uh, John Kyle and Joe Lieberman. And the three senators took my research, stuck it in their safe and then told the Defense Department, by the way, if you classify Freeman's work, We'll just read it on the Senate floor. And amazingly, they left me alone, which is really kind of cool. Thank you to the center for helping make that happen. Uh, but it got the story out. I got to write a book and, and I've got a TV show that's built on it. Uh, so if you really want to understand unrestricted warfare in the modern era, though, the most important book you can read is this book, unrestricted warfare that was written by two senior colonels of the People's Liberation Army. In 1999, it was published. And these two colonels um, basically said, if you want to displace America, you can't do it with a full on military conflict. They said, if you want to displace America, you're going to have to use unrestricted warfare, meaning nothing is out of bounds, especially economic weapons. They advocated in that book, George Soros techniques against our financial markets, which they call financial terrorism. And this book was fully endorsed by the ruling communist party. I've covered it extensively uh, in videos. We have economicwarroom.com. You can access our show, a lot of our material that we've done for free. We're on Blaze TV, but you can get almost everything you need from economicwarroom.com including what we call economic battle plans. And we did an entire one. You just go register, just give us your name and your, and your email address, and we will uh, give you access to all 110 battle plans that we've prepared uh, for our subscribers free. There is no charge for that. You can read the one on unrestricted warfare. I think, I think it's very enlightening. 
Keep in mind that in the year 1999, when this book was written, this book uh, was written by Chinese colonels, the Chinese economy was one-tenth the size of the American economy approximately. One-tenth. We were 10 times bigger than the China's, Chinese economy. Their economy was basically the size, actually a little smaller than Italy. I know that's hard to believe. Look it up. Go back to 1998, 1999. Look at the GDP of the world and the Chinese economy was smaller than Italy. In the book, they describe new ways of warfare, financial warfare, which they described as entering and subverting banking and stock markets. They talk about the use of derivatives, financial weapons of mass destruction, as Warren Buffett called them. They talk about accessing capital. They list specific financial firms like Morgan Stanley, Citigroup, uh, Goldman Sachs, Moody's, S&P, Merrill Lynch, Fidelity. Maybe that's the first time ever in a military book that they've mentioned names of Wall Street names like that. Epic Times did a great infographic on this. They called it Chinese Secret War with America. And they just labeled all of the different topics of what it could be. Uh, controlling information, infiltrating and seizing control of institutions, stealing intellectual property and destroying the economy. Uh, all of these things were in an Info Times infographic. One of the other mechanisms, you've heard it, the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, China has gone to neighbors and actually uh, countries around the world, including Latin America, and said, hey, we'll loan you money. You can build this infrastructure. You can build this plant. You can exploit these resources. They give them massive loans. In a lot of cases, the countries aren't even able to afford the loans they're being given. And then they come back and say, oh, you can't pay us? Well, we'll just take control of that. It really is economic warfare. It's all identified. And here's the saddest part. How did they get the money to do this? Two means. One, they borrowed a lot from the World Bank. They've infiltrated that institution, and that's our money that's been loaned. And number two, they've sold on Wall Street $3 trillion worth of Chinese investments to American investors. That is brilliant economic warfare. You got to hand it to them. And then they say these things publicly. Now, this is uh, quoted in Epic Times, February 2016. One of the authors of Unrestricted Warfare says, uh, it, the top headline, contain the United States by attacking its finances. Major general in the Chinese military, he was a senior colonel, now he's a major general. He says, the way to control America's lifeblood is to, is, uh, to effectively contain the United States, other countries shall think more about how to cut off the capital flow to the United States. That's four and a half years ago, and he's talking about the Chinese should cut off capital flow to the United States. Then in, in uh, uh, official house organ of the Central Committee of the Co Communist Party of China, it says economic warfare, of course, to fight the US, we have to come up with key weapons. What's the most powerful weapon China has today? It's our economic power especially our foreign exchange reserves. The key is to use it well. It is a weapon. If China stops buying American debt, other countries will pay close attention or very likely to follow. Once the printed excess dollars cannot be sold, the depreciation of the dollar will accelerate and the impact on Americans' wealth will be enormous. Now that echoes what Igor Panarin was saying. And that's what the Russians wanted to see happen in 2008 the Chinese came to the table in 2013 when dictator Xi took power. And here's, here's from International Business Times a quote, debt ceiling, China calls for world to be de-Americanized. It's the official policy to end the use of the US dollars, the international reserve currency. That's modern economic warfare, something that they started in 2013. It's not the only type of warfare that they're doing. I mean, we, the center published a great book called Warning Order, China Prepares for Conflict and Why We Must Do the Same. I wrote a chapter in that book, and here's a quote. Our intelligence estimates are that U.S. companies and the U.S. economy lose approximately $5 trillion each year or over 30% of the U.S. GDP when you fat good, Chris, thanks for showing it. When you factor the full value of the stolen innovation, we're losing $5 trillion a year 
through economic warfare, intellectual property theft to the Chinese. They've been hacking, uh, they've been monopolizing rare earth minerals, forcing IP transfer, drug warfare, which hurts our economy through fentanyl, the One Belt and One Road, strategic acquisitions, predatory trade practices, infiltration of critical technology, and even biological warfare, which they talk about in this book, which COVID is the greatest economic weapon ever unleashed on the planet Earth. Look at the devastation it's caused to our economy. And amazingly, the Chinese are saying they're through it and their economy is growing. I don't know how much we can take them at their word on that, but if that's accurate, they ruined the rest of the world's economies and they got off scot-free. Man, that would be a great economic weapon. They've raised $3 trillion of American capital in US markets, and some of it's gone to outright frauds. You may have heard of luck and coffee. They call it the Starbucks of China. Well, really, not long ago, they admitted that they phonied their accounting. Guess what? We couldn't check out the books because the Chinese Communist Party will not let you look at the books of a Chinese Communist company. And yet, it's listed on our stock exchange. There's a great movie out by a man named Dan David called The China Hustle. And he shows example after example after example where Chinese companies were listed, listed and offered for sale in the United States on our exchanges that turned out to be frauds. They're taking our money for fraudulent companies. And when you watch it, you see how he goes in to look at the factory that's supposed to be there. It's not there. And in fact, he shows the same factory showed as a factory for one company. The next week, they show it as a factory for another company. When they bring tours through, it's a complete scam. In a lot of these cases, we don't have access to the books of the Chinese companies because that's the law. That's what they require. They call it a state secret. Guess what else? The Chinese have been very crafty and they've gotten into our index funds. So much so that when you buy the S&P 500, you're not gonna end up getting Chinese companies. But if you buy the Morgan Stanley Capital International Index, which is the all country world index, you'll get a lot of Chinese companies. And an increasing amount because they've lobbied these indices to increase their China weighting. Well, fortunately, uh, the Trump administration listens to a project done by the Committee on the Present Danger of China and amplified by the Center for Security Policy and Frank Gaffney especially, and we stopped the investment of the thrift savings plan of the United States going into this new index, or not new index, but going into this index at, at, that would be putting our money of our servicemen and women in China or our active government employees. Think about how corrosive that is. If you're in the government and you find that a lot of your money is invested in China, are you going to take a hard China policy? No, it's co-opting. Then again, they raised $25 billion from us through an IPO known as Alibaba in 2014. And they took that money and bought up Silicon Valley so that they now control a lot of the movies we see. And they took some of that money and bought up a lot of emerging technology in the United States. So that is uh historic history of economic warfare and then we've covered modern economic warfare now i'm gonna put on my my crystal pull out my crystal ball and put on my magic hat and try and give you my guesses of educated guesses of what the future might look like first thing i want to warn about is the potential and i covered it in the book secret weapon i said how it could happen again uh, on a stock market crash, the Chinese know how to crash our stock markets. They've taken our capital, at least $3 trillion of it. They've shifted power to Hong Kong and Shanghai. So they're bringing a new uh, IPO, initial public offering out. You'll hear a lot about it. Uh, it will be the largest in history. It's called Ant Group, and it's gonna be brought out uh, in Hong Kong and Shanghai with the help of several of those Wall Street banks they talked about needing to infiltrate. Um, so they've taken our money and they're gonna take some more of it, but they could crash the American stock market at will. Uh, there's something called high frequency trading algorithms that account for uh, maybe 70% of the trading on the New York Stock Exchange. Most of our trading is done by computer without human intervention. Guess what, you can hack those, and if you hack them, you can literally cause a crash and nobody knows what happened. 
This happened in 2013 when the Syrian Electronic Army did something as simple as crashing the Associated Press Twitter feed. And they tweeted out, White House damaged President Hurt. Guess what? It wasn't true. It still caused the stock market to crash because those high frequency algorithms were looking out there for the news. They saw that and they said, sell, 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 sell. Like, you know, Jim Craver, sell, sell, sell. And they did and dropped the stock market hundreds of billions of dollars in an instant. China is far more sophisticated than the Syrian electronic army. They could do this on command. Um, we have a solution, by the way. I put it out in the economic war room. It's called the uptick rule. And if you want, go to economicwarroom.com, download the battle plan, look for the one on the uptick rules. Uh, it talked to George Soros even says this would work. So that's the first crystal ball fear. Second crystal ball fear is this effort to displace the US dollar's primary reserve currency of the world. Some people don't know how important that is. 50 to 60% of all international trade is currently done in US dollars. That's important because that means people have to hold dollars if they want to do trade. And the best way to hold them is to buy U.S. Treasury bonds. This is financing for a good portion of our debt. It supports our military. It allows what's called the exorbitant privilege of having the reserve currency. And that exorbitant privilege means that everybody takes dollars all the time and we can always sell our debt, which is, which is a big advantage for us, especially when we have almost $30 trillion worth of it. Well, this made Vladimir Putin very jealous in the early 2000s, and he started railing against the dollar's reserve currency. He tried to get the Chinese to join him in 2008 to attack the dollar. They said no. In 2013, though, dictator Xi said, yes, we're going to work to eliminate the dollar. I, I just read you that headline from 2013. Keep in mind, the dollar is, enables us as a reserve currency to impose sanctions on rogue nations like North Korea and Iran. And we say, hey, you can't access dollars if you wanna do international trade, which really hurts them. And we've had a strength from having the dollar as the reserve currency. When the British lost the reserve currency, the United States, which took the reserve currency mantle, was able to dictate them up to them on the Suez Canal. So what does China intend? They want to displace the dollar. Now, they have tried since 2013 repeatedly and failed to put the yuan internationalized. People actually don't trust the Chinese currency as much as they expected them to. So they're stuck holding our debt. And they have about a trillion dollars worth of our debt. And they're stuck holding it. They can't dump it because it would hurt them more than it would hurt us. At least that's what a lot of economists. But they've, they've threatened to dump the debt. The problem is, is that the yuan is not deep enough. They don't have deep enough capital markets yet. They're working on it. That's why they're moving everything to Hong Kong and Shanghai. And nobody really wants the yuan. It's limited in its use in international trade. And they ha didn't have the systems or the infrastructure. But I'm here to tell you they're creating the systems now. They've already created an alternative to the internet. Yes. You may call it the splinter net because there may be the Chinese version and the American version coming up. They've created an alternative to the World Bank called the Asia Development Bank. And we urged our allies, don't join that. Don't be a part of that. But they did anyway. And Larry Summers, former Treasury Secretary, former president of Harvard, uh, said this is the end of American economic hegemony because they have developed an alternative bank. They've created something known as CHIPS the China International Payment System rather than SWIFT, which is the system that we tend to control that, that is do more dollar-based. They've created the BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, in a compact with South Africa uh, to hurt the dollar, to replace the dollar. And uh, they have their Belt and Road. And they're also creating a digital currency electronic payment platform. It's like Bitcoin without the anonymity or the limits on currency and without, you know, where the Chinese government can look at everything just like they do with TikTok or they've been accused of doing with TikTok. It is a digitized yuan. So they weren't able to get the paper yuan to replace the dollar. They're hoping the world will leapfrog into a digitized currency and they're running experiments on it now. And there's a tie-in with Alipay from the Ant Group, which is raising up to $90 billion of Western capital uh, to fund their operations. Keep in mind, Alipay does $18 trillion worth of transactions annually, 
and Alipay has 1 billion users. They're like PayPal, Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, Visa, MasterCard, all rolled into one. That's where they're heading to replace the dollar. That's the second thing. The third thing with the crystal ball, and I'll wrap up so Chris can ask questions or, or Adam can share questions. Uh, the third effort they're working on is space. If they wiped out our satellites, they'd wipe out communications and our economy. They have EMP capabilities, which would wipe out our economy, but keep people basically alive, at least until we started to starve and, and uh, die of thirst and so forth. They're mining asteroids. There are hundreds of trillions of dollars worth of metals and minerals in space, and they're, they're preparing to mine asteroids. They're not doing it yet, but they're preparing with their uh, dark side of the moon operations. And they have the ability to set up transportation from space where they could put people pick people up from one area, take them in a rocket and land anywhere on the planet in about an hour. And the cost of that is dropping dramatically. If they get reusable rockets, it comes down. You know, the difference between building and buying your own 787 or buying a seat on the 787 uh, flight, that's how much they will lower the cost of that. So what should we be doing? We've got to stop the IP theft. We've got to stop their in involvement in research institutions, Confucius Institutes and so forth. We've got to stop funding communist enterprises like Ant Group. We should make them pay the $2 trillion they owe American bondholders from pre-World War II Chinese debt that they, they paid the British off, but they never paid America off. We should deregister and delist all Chinese shares until they comply with our laws, and we need to hold China accountable for the coronavirus on the international stage. We've also got to be considering our own digital currencies, win the space race. We cannot ban fracking and we need to get our fiscal house in order. No Green New Deal if China is exempt. We can't allow for that. And on the personal level, it's got huge implications for your portfolio. So I urge you to go to economicwarroom.com. If you've got a financial advisor, tell them about Economic War Room so we can educate them. Economicwarroom.com forward slash advisor. You can nominate your advisor to be trained with all of this knowledge and information to better handle your portfolio. And with that, I will stop and I will take any questions that Chris has or Adam has for me. Well, I tell you, I have a ton of questions, but I think it's much more important that members of our audience get to ask their questions uh, in the last uh, 13 minutes. So, uh, Adam, would you uh, please take it over and, uh, and relay the questions that our members of our audience have for uh, Kevin? Thank you very much, Kevin, for the incredible briefing. Thank you, Chris. Chinese companies are rushing for U.S. IPOs ahead of new restrictions. The data shows that the money Chinese companies raised in the U.S. capital market in 2020 reached new records. What do you think are the reasons behind this? What loopholes are those companies taking advantage of? And how can we hold them accountable? Well, the reason behind it is that they realized that we had a 100 to 0 vote in the United States Senate. Uh, so it was completely bipartisan. And Senator Rubio, I think, took a, a big lead on this. That, that said that if you don't uh, comply with American laws, uh, accounting laws and disclosure and that sort of thing, you cannot remain on American exchanges. And so they wanted to get in as rapidly as they could because unfortunately, the good news of the law is, is it was, well, it wasn't a law, but the Senate passed a bill to that effect. The bad news is there was a three-year window. So they, that would allow them three years before they had to comply. So everyone was rushing in. The second problem is Wall Street is conflicted. Wall Street will earn hundreds of millions of dollars in fees uh, from selling IPOs to Americans. And they don't tell any of these you know, huge, massive risks to our nation. And it gets even more conflicted when you have family members. And Peter Schweitzer has done a brilliant job of pointing out family members of both Democrats and Republicans that uh, have been conflicted because of business dealings in China. Wall Street, the worst among them. So we, we, have, to, we have to stop that. We have to expose that. Uh, you know, there, there's new uh, expose. New York Post, I think, has out on Hunter Biden's business dealings in Ukraine uh, today. I think everybody should read that and, and draw from that whatever conclusions they will. It, the fact is the Chinese and others know to target American politicians and their family uh, and, and co-op them with business deals. And we've got to put a stop to that. 
What is the most likely economic weapon of mass destruction to be used in the remainder of the 2020 election? Uh, well, my biggest fear has been a crash of the stock market. Uh, USA Today put this out in 2016, an amazing graphic, and we put it in one of our shows, that it is 100% correlated in a stock market crash, the party in power loses power in the White House, period. It, because people panic and wonder, I've got to have a change. My portfolio is down. And so my, my biggest concern that happened in 2008, uh, whether good or bad for the Americans, the reality is, is that there were elements in the world that knew that they could crash our economy and change the White House, uh, the party in power. And, and that's well known. It's well documented in the literature. In, the, in this book, uh, Unrestricted Warfare, they even say a single man-made stock market crash is a new concept weapon, and they allude to George Soros. They have two heroes in there, George Soros and Osama bin Laden, if that gives you any idea of how malevolent that book really is. So I'm worried about an attempted stock market crash. I tried to get to the administration the solution of the uptick rule. I'm hoping somebody is listening, and I'm hoping they're ready to address it, because in 2008, the Bush administration was completely clueless even despite my best efforts to warn them in the summer of 2008, they didn't hear. I didn't have the access there then that I needed. And so I wasn't able to get that warning across. Before the market crashed, I told them the stock market will determine the next White House occupant, and they didn't listen. Can you discuss the economic war being waged against the U.S. by other countries, specifically the EU? Well, the European Union uh, has a different model. Uh, it tends to be a more socialist model, and they hamper American companies whenever they want to uh, by uh, putting requirements on them. Uh, I don't see the EU ultimately as our primary competitor, but elements within the EU have been co-opted just as elements on Wall Street have been co-opted. I'll give you an example. Uh, when we did the work on the Iranian uh, where they were literally accessing our banking system and they were hiding, they were stripping off their name from things to evade sanctions. We got internal emails from Standard Charter Bank, I think, where it said, those effing Americans, who are they to tell us who we can do business with? Uh, that was not a strong pro-America stance. And all of the groups in the European Union that are siding with China, taking money from China, taking connections with China, I think are aiding and abetting uh, an enemy of the United States. And I think that's what we need to worry about with the uh, European Union. How would another stock market bubble amplify this problem in the coming years? Every great stock market crash uh, tends to begin with a massive stock market bubble. It uh, happened in 1929, it happened in, in 2000 uh, with the tech wreck, it happened in 2008, not that the stock market was overpriced, but the economic bubble was the housing market. Uh, right now, we have an economy that's largely closed. Lots of the American economy remain closed, a lot of people remaining on unemployment, even though the recovery has actually been pretty good, better than expected. Uh, the stock market is near all-time highs, uh, the economy is not. Uh, so that just makes us more vulnerable. It doesn't mean we can't grow through it, grow out of it, but it means we're more vulnerable in that period. Can you give a little, little more detail about the splinter net? Yeah, the, the Chinese are prepared to uh, to have an alternative. They, they, they seeded this. Uh, a few years back, they told Google, Unless you give us access to absolutely everything, uh, we won't allow you to operate here. And Google got all upset and backed out and left China. Uh, I'll tell you, Google's back in China, and I haven't seen that, uh, that the Chinese Communist Party's backed down from their demand of, of access to everything. They have built uh, an alternative system that, that their version of internet that doesn't, uh, doesn't intersect with the rest of the internet and they're offering it to the Russians and offering it to neighboring states. It, it is uh, potentially a game changer because it may be built on, on newer and faster technology. And aided and abetted with that is the Chinese efforts in 5G, which I didn't talk about, but it's another form of Chinese economic warfare 
where they were pushing Huawei and ZTE and equipment that that had you know potential backdoors to the Chinese Communist Party uh, that they were pushing into our system. Those same groups have built a lot of the splinter net, the other, the Chinese side of it. How specifically can Bitcoin be used as a weapon? Well, Bitcoin has some characteristics that are very, very different from the digital currency electronic payment platform that China is, is creating. Uh, what's common is it's electronic payments platform. Uh, what's very different about it is it has anonymity. It is a shared ledger, so everybody knows where the money, not where it is, but they know what money is there. What they don't know is who has it or how it's transferred, but it's all agreed to that it's real and it exists, and you can identify that Bitcoin exists, and the person who happens to have it can then transfer it to another person. So it's a shared ledger of information, that it, but it's anonymous to governments. The, the digital currency platform is not anonymous. So if we had a superior digital currency that had some of the beneficial features, another beneficial feature of Bitcoin is it, it, you can't just manufacture it out of a whole area. You have to mine it. There's a limited number. Well, the Chinese could produce and, and create as many uh, digital coins as they wanted to. If we had a limited digital currency that had some level of anonymity and some protection of the user where they didn't see every financial transaction that you did, that would be a superior weapon that we could use against their digital currency platform. All right, I think this will have to be the last one. Um, what about George Soros's money influencing the election of DAs across the US? Oh, well, we, 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 we don't talk about George Soros. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> did you see that? That's what they did to Newt Gingrich on Fox News. We can't talk about it. It is well known, well established that George Soros has funded district attorneys across the country. And you see the net effect of it when the DAs are not enforcing the law, when we have these big riots and some of the same people are creating bail funds for people who've broken the law. They're rioting or they're burning things or whatever, and there's bail funds created for them. George Soros talks about almost gleefully the idea of street riots coming to America. And we've covered George Soros in detail in the Economic War Room. If you want to dig down and really see what he's talked about and what he's doing, uh, you need to go to, we have a whole episode where we feature him. Uh, you got to go to economicwarroom.com and download the battle plan and watch the segments on Soros. Uh, it, it really is insidious and, and it's, a, it's a threat to the United States of America, in my opinion. Thank you. Chris, I'll hand it back to you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Adam. Well, uh, Kevin, thank you so much. That was an incredibly informative hour. Uh, I uh, think we covered a lot of topics. Uh, I really am intrigued. Uh, and I know I'm going to go to Economic War Room and, and look at what George Soros is up to. That, some of the questions that I had jotted down here were about George Soros in particular and what he has done and what he might do heading into the election coming up. And I know that that information is available at economicwarroom.com. So I can assure you I will be there. And I'm sure many of the uh, viewers today will be there. And of course, this webinar will be on the Center for Security Policies. YouTube channel and more people in the future will be able to get this information uh, and, and benefit from it uh, and inform themselves about the many forms of economic warfare that the U.S. is being targeted by, uh, especially uh, China. Um, I'm intrigued about the whole fracking thing. Uh, I've seen, you know, I, I've come from a state like you, uh, which is uh, very much in the oil patch, and I've been uh, disturbed by all of a sudden out of nowhere, anti-fracking activists cropping up in the middle of the oil patch, uh, claiming that fracking is this horrible thing. It's been around since the 1940s. It, it occurred to me, and now you've opened my eyes, that there had to be something at work there. That just didn't materialize overnight. It's not a spontaneous movement. It's, it's foreign, in fact. Uh, and correct. so thank you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, taking the time to visit with us today. Um, I'm going to continue to read your books and follow your work uh, going forward. We're very fortunate at the center to have you as a fellow. Um, and America is very fortunate to have you 
uh, is a modern day Paul Revere to warn us about these threats, which unfortunately are not being looked at by the so-called mainstream media. So uh, with that, uh, I wish you a, a, a blessed day and a, a great rest of the week and a great weekend. And I hope to cross paths with you again soon, uh, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Adam.